thank you for joining us again as we journey through the Word of God during this special virtual camp meeting, 2020 Vision Revelation. Our theme is Foundation Stones, Principles for Living. Why did we choose that? Well, first of all, as Stephen Covey said in his classic work, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that we need to begin with the end in mind. And so one thing that we are doing is we're beginning with the end in mind. Jesus is coming soon. And so how do we get our thoughts in line with that? And how do we actually engage the necessary tools both to understand the word of God and to really clearly view what's happening around us today? Those are two things we're holding together. It's not one or the other, it's actually both. So when we look at society, we look at the world as we discovered in our first program, we actually considered some very unique things about society today that maybe you hadn't thought about, that you hadn't considered. So as we're going into this second segment, this second investment in the building of those foundation stones, the principles for living, we want to bridge back into where we left off in our first segment. But first of all, let's ask the Lord to guide us and to give us the Holy Spirit so we can understand what we are going to learn and hear. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to stand before your people and, and actually share with them from the word of God and can bring into this discussion in this presentation the elements that are transpiring in the world today in a very real way. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will grant us the understanding that we need in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when we left off last time, we left off with a quotation from Edward Bernays that said, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. Now, that's probably a little bit challenging for you as it was for me when I first read it. But let's connect it to the first segment. We began by talking about polyamory, a relational uh, context for people in the 21st century where you have a consensual relationship between multiple people and they literally share uh, not only in feelings but also sexually. So it is basically the idea of what um, having multiple lovers would be like, yet they all know about each other and they all agree to it. And why did we bring that up? Because our objective was to show you how prophecy is literally being fulfilled. In fact, we took as a very clear understanding of the word of God, those things that are told to us by the apostle Paul and what he shared with us in the word of God in 2 Timothy chapter three, that in the last days men will be love is a pleasure more than lovers of God. And then in addition to that, we also discovered that people would be in the last days, they would not have natural affection, which we took you back to Adam and Eve to put that in context of what that looks like. So many of the things that are transpiring in the world today are actually proposed by and suggested by individuals we have never met. In fact, they actually set the trends. And these are individuals and in, inclusive of not only corporate executives and advertising moguls and, and Hollywood personalities and sports personalities and business leaders and political leaders, you know, even individuals in our own community that we feel have statue or significance, but we really don't have a close relationship with them. They actually form much of the dialogue as well as we could say our thoughts. They actually begin to shape our thoughts and our views. Hence, they shape our values. And as we're going through this part of this foundation stones and we're building in the direction of understanding that the word of God can be trusted, the word of God is a word that is filled with integrity and it is, it, it's responsible. I mean, you, you can take it and you can say what is going to happen in the future. And it's not about just the future of your life, my life. It's really about global impact. And so that's really what we're drilling down on today because there are some things that we're going to discover today that happened a long time ago that still persist or that remains with us to this day. 
So again, let me take us back to this particular phrase because now we're going to expand on it. And as we stated in our first session, Edward Bernays was actually someone who came along and kind of broke the mold of what um, public relations and advertising look like. And he did so because he built on the research work of Sigmund Freud, who was his uncle. So Edward Bernays came, to, came along and grabbed all of this material and began to talk about, you know, or began to at least postulate. In, that, in other words, he began to put together a hypothesis that, well, if we know all this information about how the human mind works, can we manipulate the human mind? Can we literally take control over the masses of people? Can we literally control what people think and their views and their values and their perceptions and their perspectives? And basically, Edward Bernays said, yeah, we can do that. And there are individuals who picked up on that, that idea. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to show you how the deposit was made in society. Well, first of all, let's go back to an example I gave you in the first session, and that individual was Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler found out about this book, Propaganda. Now, that was a book that Edward Bernays wrote. And the book, Propaganda, is a book that simply suggested that minds could be manipulated and, and tastes could be formed and ideas could be suggested by individuals who could basically bring you to where they want you to be. Now, we know that in advertising that everything is strategic because studies are done and test surveys are conducted and all kinds of processes are engaged to get you to buy a particular product, even your children, even something as simple as cereal. So cereal is at a particular place on the, on the shelf, and most of us know this reality, and it's placed on the shelf, so when they go down the aisle, they actually have it at their eye level and their hand level. So they reach and they grab it, and mothers being who they are, they wanna make their children happy, but unfortunately, they don't live by principle, and I'm saying this respectfully, but they don't live by principle, and they say, no, sweetheart, you don't need that because it has nothing but sugar. It really doesn't have any value. But they see their child, and the child has, you know, they, the commercials have been geared to the child, and the child is all excited. Look, look, I mean, look at this particular cereal. This is the one that I saw on my favorite program. And, of course, they don't even articulate all of that. They just grab it, and I've seen it over and over again. They grab it with their two little hands, and they take it, and they reach over into the basket, and they drop it in. And mom has to pay for it, or dad has to pay for it. Somebody's got to pay for it. Well, anyway, all of that's being motivated, and your child is literally, I dare say, controlled by people other than the parents. Well, that happens in other ways as well. So let's talk about one of the things that Edward Bernays did that really changed how we live today. Way back at the turn of the 20th century, it was basically or virtually impossible to get women to smoke. And so what they decided they would do is that they would facilitate a process and Edward Bernays took all of his scientific data that had been accumulated about how the human mind works and extracted it from Sigmund Freud, his uncle. And so he decided that there was a particular strategy that he could engage to get women to smoke. And this is what he did. This is a true story. This is what he did. He hired a woman or paid a woman to basically light up a cigarette in a room of men. Now, what he did was he actually chose a very good-looking woman, stunning woman, that would immediately capture all of the men's attention. So at a specific time, and she was given what the particular cue would be, and that she would take this cigarette, and she would take it out, and she would light it. Well, all the other women in the room, whatever number of women there were in the room, were aghast. The men were drawn to this bold, brash, defiant woman. Here she is, beautiful. And then she lights a cigarette, and men started moving her direction. Now, if you look at some of the old commercials, you'll see a continuation of that thought, because in the old commercials, you actually have this idea 
of men being drawn to women who are cutting against societal norms. It means that the bad girl gets the guy. Well, this is how it would look in future years from Edward Bernays' test run. They would have a woman on television, she would be smoking, and of course, all of this is before it was uh, removed from media as being a way to promote sales of cigarettes. And the woman would light a, the woman would actually put a cigarette in her mouth, and all of a sudden, all these hands would come out of nowhere with lighters, and they would go flick, 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 and they would all light up, and all these men were happy to light her cigarette because it also carried a sexual connotation. So we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we've never heard of. Well, is this something that plays over into our religious world, into Christianity? It actually does. So now, let's look at how Sunday came to prominence. Because when most people talk about Sunday, they rush to the Bible and they try to extract from the Word of God something that would make you feel like they literally know what they're talking about, but they really don't because they don't have the history. So let's talk about where did this really all begin? I mean, how did people pick Sunday? I mean, that's not what the Bible teaches. So how do we end up with all of these religions all of these denominations that are Christian, so-called, uh, that are supposedly adhering to Scripture, supposedly believe in the Word of God, but at the same time, they're not in the Word of God, either in belief or practice. Go back to a long time ago. This is at the beginning of the, the period of time we identify as A.D., after the dissension of Christ or after the birth of Christ. Sunday was another work day in the Roman Empire. So now we have to go all the way back to Rome. Now, this is important because we're now going in conjunction to uh, Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, what you're going to find is you have Christ gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream and only da Daniel is able to interpret it. And so this dream is one that shows a succession of kingdoms. Starts with Babylon, then it goes to Medo-Persia, then it goes to Greece, then it goes to Rome. And then from Rome, it goes to divided Rome. And divided Rome are the iron and clay of the feet. So the legs of iron, that's Rome. That's the Roman Empire. That's the symbolic uh, designation to Rome, for Rome. But then you get to the feet of iron and clay, that's Europe. And Europe was divided into 10 kingdoms after uh, the Roman Empire fell. Well, what happened when Rome, when Rome basically disintegrated as a power, you still had a desire to hold the Roman Empire together. So there was a period of time that Constantine moved the controlling seat of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople modern-day Istanbul, a little bit of history. So after he moved it to Istanbul, then after a while, it was moved back to Rome. It was called Constantinople after the founder, Constantine. Constantine threw a lot of weight around. Well, one of the things that Constantine recognized is that the kingdom, the Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire, it was somewhat divided. It was at conflict. It was with. It had conflict internally. Well, you had Christians on the one hand, and you had paganism on the other. So you have paganism and Christianity. But he's trying to glue all of these religions together. He's really trying to make everybody kind of just kind of get along. And because the Christians were at odds with the pagans, and the pagans didn't like the Christians because the pagans were into all kinds of things that the Christians, of course, would have nothing to do with, then the Christians said, you know, we, are, we want to separate ourselves. But then there was an odd player that was out there, and this odd player were, were a, the Christians who actually were adhering to the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, you really didn't have first-day Christians yet. You just had nominal Christians who were not really Sabbatarians. So they were Christians, but they really did not have a defined identity. 
you didn't have Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostals, Church of God in Christ, Church of Christ, uh, Church of the Brethren. You didn't have Assemblies of God. You didn't have Lutherans, Methodists. You didn't have any of those denominations. In fact, this is really at the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. The papacy had not really come to its formation. It was still in its formative stages, so it wasn't really quite formed yet. So at that particular time, Constantine said, hmm, what can I do to bring everybody together? And this is what he decided to do. He decided to take the approach that he could utilize Sunday and infuse it as a day of significance in the Roman Empire, and then everybody, because they were loyal citizens of the Roman Empire, they were proud to be Roman citizens, et cetera, et cetera, then they would rally around this particular day. Well, by rallying around this particular day, he recognized that it was a day that would coalesce or bring together all of the different factions or different elements, belief systems, if you will, within the empire. So in 321, March the 7th to be exact, uh, even though it was just another work day in the Roman Empire, Roman Emperor Constantine issued a civil decree making Sunday, now here is a very important point, and this is where the church, the Christian church begins to make its turn. Because remember, we are focusing in our building the foundation stones and principles for living, we are now working through a specific topic, and that is when Christianity took a wrong turn. So here we have the first indication of when it took a wrong turn. So there was a civil decree that went forth from Constantine making Sunday a day of rest from labor. And this is exactly what Constantine stated. Because it became law, it was actually preserved. So we know what he did, and we know how he did it, and we know what he said. So it says this, all judges and city people and the craftsmen, that's the common laborer, shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. Now that's important for us to note because when he calls it the venerable day of the sun, he's actually talking about this day has significance, it has prominence, it has, mm, it has a place in the culture of the Roman Empire. You could also say customs as well. So the culture and the customs drove Constantine to focus all of his attention on bringing people together, and he did it around one day. Now, you would think there would probably be another approach to bring everybody together. Like in America, people stand when they hear the national anthem or they naturally put their hand over their heart when the um, flag is, is being raised. Uh, those are things that unify people. But then again, they don't always unify people because we've seen people kneeling during the national anthem as a symbol of protest, or we've seen people who don't uh, necessarily cover their heart with their right hand when the flag is being saluted, or those who served in the military, they will actually take the time to do a military salute to the flag. However, Constantine took this approach. Because worship is at the center of the conflict between these two people groups, the pagans and the Christians, let's take one day that is more prominent, and in fact, because he was a high priest. Now, this little piece has not been known extensively or just to the degree until recent years, and there have been a couple of historians as well as archaeologists who've gone through the pr process of basically bringing this truth to light, and this is what they discovered. Constantine was literally uh, a high priest or a priest within this cult factor that uh, worshiped the sun. So notice that he gives reference to the sun when he recognizes it as the venerable day of the sun. So he doesn't just call it on Sunday. He calls it the venerable day. So it is a day that he is ascribing honor as well as a significance, and it's his objective to turn the entire empire in that direction. Well, now he does that in 321. 
So he's now laid the legislative or basically political platform for something else to take place, and it's the something else that really pushes us into this Sunday observance that has saturated the entire world today. So when we look at the Council of Laodicea, the Council of Laodicea, and you may say, well, what is a council? Well, let me tell you what a council is. If you go to the book of Acts, you will discover that there was a dispute between Peter and Paul. And when Peter and Paul had this dispute, it was whether or not the new believers should be circumcised, the males. And uh, there, was a, there was a pretty big rift about it. And Peter said, yes. Paul said, no. Peter said, yes. Paul said, no. Peter said, yes, yes. And Paul said, no way. And so they said, okay, let's just stop all of the drama. And they said, let's have a church business meeting. All right, so I know you're familiar with that term. So they have this church business meeting. And when they have this business meeting, they call it a council. Now, that council was actually the council at Jerusalem. And I'll tell you who presided. There was a guy who was in charge of the proceedings. He was called the bishop but not the bishop in the way that you see it played out today in Roman Catholicism. Bishop just simply meant he was the elder. He was the one who was responsible for governing or overseeing the proceedings. You always have to have a chairman unless you don't want a well-run meeting. So you want an order and you want structure, and so that's what they wanted. So they had opposing sides, opposing views, and so everybody who believed like Peter moved to one side, and everybody who was on Paul's side, it went that side. And so all of a sudden, you know, at the end, and in fact, it took them a couple of weeks to work through this. You would think this would really not be that deep, but it literally took them a while to work through whether or not those who were becoming members of the Christian church, the men specifically, should be circumcised as a symbol of loyalty. And where did they get that from? Well, it goes all the way back to Abraham and, of course, it comes through Moses and right down through the line. And that was a way of God's men, God's children, specifically the males, show that they were loyal to the Lord. All right, enough about that. So anyway, the Jerusalem Council met and they came to a conclusion. And they decided that... They did not need, the new believers, the new male believers, did not need to have circumcision, circumcision. Pardon me. So once that was decided, Peter and Paul shook hands, they hugged each other, and they moved on with life. Well, in this particular council, this is long, this is 300 years afterward, or, or thereabouts, maybe as much as 320 or 30 years later. But what, what's interesting is that when you look at this council, they meet together in Laodicea. Now, Laodicea is mentioned in, in the Bible in Revelation chapter 3. It is the last of the seven churches. And when you look at Revelation chapter 3 and you go to the last church, the church of Laodicea, it concludes seven dispensations of the church periods. So you have the first church, Ephesus, it covers a certain period. And then following uh, Ephesus, then you go right on through seven sequential periods uh, all the way down to Laodicea. Now, what's important about that is Laodicea was an actual city. You can actually define or locate, better word, Laodicea today, but Laodicea does not have the prominence that it did at that point. Laodicea was actually a very wealthy city. It was known for its bath salts and also for the... For the um, the, uh, the ointment that they had for uh, purifying eye uh, ailments and that kind of thing. And so Laodicea was actually wealthy. And so as a result of the income of Laodicea that, and I think you may have heard this before, and they had an earthquake, and after this earthquake that devastated their city, that they did not need government funding to be able to rebuild their city. They were so self-sufficient because of the wealth of that city. Kind of like a New York City or probably even more affluent than that. Think of it in the terms of a city like um, San Francisco. Really rich city. So Laodicea was chosen for whatever reason 
as a place to hold what's called a synod or a council meeting. So it was a regional synod, and that meant all of the churches in what was then called Asia Minor. So that would have been all of modern-day Turkey and what was then called Galatia and Cappadocia. That's all of the area of modern-day Turkey, all the way back over into Syria and into modern-day Jordan. All of the Christian people would come to, or they at least would send representatives for this particular meeting. So when they met, I know that was a lot of history, but I wanted to make sure you really got it. So when they met in 363 to 364, they decided to make a decision about the day of worship. Now this is a very pivotal, pivotal point uh, because what happens in this particular decision tells us that it was at this time that those individuals who were Christian at that time decidedly moved away from scripture as the only rule of faith. Now, let's not miss that. That's important. That the Bible is to be our only rule of faith, but they moved away from scripture as the only rule of faith. So what did they decide? Well, let's take a look at it. Now, I'm going to read this for you, and this needs to really be understood in the in the context of what Constantine had already done in setting aside Sunday, Venerable Day of the Sun, as a primary day for the entire empire. Listen to what it says. Christians must not Judaize. Now, you may have never heard that word before, but Judaize basically is a term that is suggesting that there should not be the continuation of adherence to what they deemed was the Jewish Sabbath. But you and I know it's not the Jewish Sabbath. In fact, you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and it is clear that Sabbath is a commemoration of the creation. So take that off the table. So that's not accurate. But again, our minds are molded, our tastes are formed by individuals we've never heard of. So what we're seeing now is that indeed, these individuals who made up the Council of Laodicea, they set in motion a mindset, a headset, if you will, of calling, first of all, calling the seventh-day Sabbath, which did not belong to the Jews. It predates the flood before there was ever Abraham, before there was ever Jacob, who, was, who became Israel, from which we call the Jews descendants of Jacob, and Abraham, of course. So all of this is pre-flood. So Adam and Eve were given the Sabbath as a day of rest, and God gave it to them, blessed it, and sanctified it. So what's interesting about this is in one, just one stroke of the pen, so to speak, they actually changed the vocabulary by saying Judaizing, so Christians must not Judaize. So they targeted who they were wanting to change, Christians, you guys, this had nothing to do with the pagans in the Roman Empire. Christians, you must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath. Well, in this document, it's obvious that they acknowledge that there is a seventh-day Sabbath, but they really don't want to have everybody worshiping on the Sabbath or have anybody worshiping on the Sabbath. So they said you cannot Judaize but must work on that day. Ah, so now we have a legal enforcement because cannot work on that day. But notice, if you will, this is not just a matter of the state saying it as in Constantine. This is really them, the religious leaders, saying you, can't, you must work on the Sabbath. Now that becomes a problem. Then you also have this introduction of another phrase that is with us to this day. And this is where the confusion comes in Revelation chapter 1. When John, the revelator, makes this statement in Revelation chapter 1, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Well, when he says I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, people who worship on the first day of the week immediately grab and they say, look, I worship on the Lord's day. But the context of the origin of that phrase, Lord's day, started in this time. Let me go back to this other page, this other slide, 363, 364 A.D., but the terminology remains with us to this day. So you have two things, Judaizers making the Sabbath a Jewish thing, and then 
the Lord's Day being synonymous with Sunday. Both are erroneous. But go further. If they can, resting then as Christians. So now they give a stipulation for how Christians are identified. So Christians are now identified from this time going forward, 363, 364, that Christians rest on Sunday. Well, that's lethal because what that says is that they have just totally thrown the Bible under the bus, the proverbial bus. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, now here comes the penalty. So the penalty is in the context of if they, if they uh, function as Jews, okay, if they shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. So now you end up with this kind of curse that falls on people who don't do what the church says. So now the church has elevated itself as a superior authority for humanity. Now, this has nothing to do with scripture. Again, this has everything to do with the church exerting authority over humanity. This is a lot that happens. This is a lot packed in to one action. It's actually Canon 29. And if you were to Google this Council of Laodicea, which you can find, it's on, you know, it's, and you don't even have to go to Wikipedia. I mean, there are uh, new, numerous, I had a difficult time getting that out. Try it again. Numerous different web pages that will give you the context of all of the different canons that are listed in that regard. All right, so now, stay with me. What is anathema? So they threw that word in there. So let's find out what's an, what anathema is. Anathema is a formal curse by a pope or a council of the church excommunicating a person or denouncing a doctrine. Okay, now the church is saying, we're the standard. We're the ones who will tell you what to do. We're the ones who will tell you how to think. We're the ones who will tell you how you should believe and not the word of God. Now, this has nothing to do with a church taking an action such as, well, we want to paint the sanctuary light blue, and another part of the church says, no, we want to paint it off white. This is actually dealing with doctrine, and this is what makes this so lethal. What makes this so um, challenging for any Bible-believing Christian is because they have counted the word of God, and they have actually introduced a process, introduced a thought structure that now displaces the word of God and it elevates the church as the standard by which everyone knows supposedly what they should do. And hence, they become what they consider to be the depositories of truth, which is not biblical, okay? So let's look at Revelation 12, 7 through 13 and Revelation 17, 13, 1 through 9. Can we pause right here? Can she just freeze frame? Okay. So can, can, she, can she take it back a little bit? Because I didn't realize until I got started that I didn't even have my Bible up there. Now, that's bad. Can she go back? Okay, no worries. Okay. Wonderful. Glad we have a solution. All right, here we go. That's exactly right. Exactly. Okay. All right. So now let's look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 13. Listen to what we find happening in this passage. This is how we begin to see how prophecy is fulfilled. We will take what's happened in history and we will take what is happening now. Now, we've already started with the now, with the polyamory, but now we're taking with what has happened then, historically. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Wouldn't anticipate it, but it happened. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, 
and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. That means the dragon didn't prevail. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which is accused, which is accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Notice what it says beginning with verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you, that's to us, having great wrath because he knows or knoweth that he hath but a short time. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Okay, now we're going to take a look at chapter 17, and there's actually going to be a sermon about Revelation chapter 17 on Friday night. So I encourage you to watch that sermon in this series of the virtual camp meeting 2020 vision revelation. But now let's, even though I have the, the sequence on the slide set up for 17, Let's take a look at uh, Revelation 13, 1 through 9. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his authority. Notice what it says. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Well, this is the second time we're really seeing, or third time, actually, that we're seeing blasphemy as an issue. Notice it continues. To blaspheme his name in his tabernacle into them that dwell in heaven. So between verses 5 and 6, blaspheme or blasphemies or blasphemy is actually introduced three times. So this means that this power is distinctly against God's word and against God's system. Verse 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not found or who are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So we find that there's a distinction between the world and those who are in Christ because those who are in Christ, they are in a book called the book of life and they're connected to the, to the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Well, all of this is important. If you go with me to Revelation chapter 17, we have just one more element that we're going to add to this. In Revelation chapter 17 starts off this way. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, this blasphemy thing keep, keeps coming up. Having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
Now, you can continue and read the rest of it, but there's some key pieces that connect all of this together because you have a beast, and as we understand from reading the book of Daniel, that a beast represents a kingdom. But in prophecy, a woman represents a church. So in Revelation 17, you have a woman riding a beast, which is a kingdom. And whenever you see those two things together, what you're seeing, church and state. So in fact, what we see between the Council of Laodicea and what Constantine did, you see a combining of church and state for the enactment of elevating Sunday to a level of prominence, even as a worship day, which is not within scripture. Now, these three passages that we've read, Revelation 12, 7 through 13, which introduces the dragon and his enmity and his, his uh, angst, if you will, or his hatred for Christ is laid out in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 13, 1 through 9, we have the introduction of a political kingdom that rises out of the sea, which according to Revelation chapter 17 and uh, verse 15, Listen to what it says, if you want to understand what the sea is. And he said unto me, the water which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So now we have a working definition for that. So we understand that this beast power literally has authority over the earth. Well, let's ask ourselves some critical question. So since we're on this side of the Council of Laodicea, did that particular decision end up impacting the entire world? Quick answer, yes. So you have people going into church buildings every Sunday. They're thinking that they're doing it as a result of the requirement because Jesus rose on Sunday. But that's not in the Bible either. There's nothing where the apostles said, Jesus said that on the day that, I wrote, on the day that he rose, that he wanted us to observe or reverence that day. But then you also have the problem because in scripture, it says, the, I am the Lord, I change not. That's in Malachi. And you have the 10 commandments and the 10 commandments gives you a definite, a definite timetable. It says, remember the Sabbath day in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor. So you have a defined timetable. You have six consecutive days and then you have the seventh. Well, in Europe, they've actually changed the day of worship from uh, Sunday. They've moved it from being first day to being seventh day, and they've moved first day to Monday. Well, you can play with the calendar all you want to, but in reality, the venerable day of the sun kind of checks you because it's always been Sunday, which is why it was called the venerable day of the sun, because we actually get the days of the week from Roman, the Roman Empire. So that's kind of a play on your own head to say that you're just going to move the days to try to get to seven or put Sunday on the seventh day. It's a game. So remember, let's remember what Edward Bernays said. Our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, largely by men we've never met. So you don't know anybody who changed the calendar, but they have done that in Europe. And when they changed the calendar, they didn't get your permission. They just simply flipped it. But it didn't matter because when you understand historically that Constantine was pulling everybody to worship on the venerable day of the sun, it can't be Monday because that's the venerable day of the moon. Moon day, Monday. Okay, so now that we've kind of worked this all out, we understand that really what's going on is people are playing a game. And the game that they're playing actually affects you. So unfortunately, because you haven't known that the game was played, you've been kind of going along with it and you were just kind of saying, okay, makes sense to me. Jesus rose on the first day of the week, rose on Easter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Easter, by the way, is not in the Bible. But anyway, so you have all of this going on and people just kind of fall in the rhythm of tradition. But that's not good enough. We need to go to the word of God. So let me share with you what's really happening, what's really behind all of this. And to really capture the true meaning, you've got to go back to Revelation chapter 12. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. Notice what it says, that Satan is angry with a particular group of people. And the people that he's angry with have a classification or characteristics that 
make them pretty easily identifiable. In other words, you really don't have to strain your brain to get there. So who are they? Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wrought with the woman who went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Slam dunk. Now we know who they are. They are commandment-keeping people, which means you'd have to obey 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All 10 of the commandments. And then they have the testimony of Jesus. Well, if you really want to understand what the testimony of Jesus Christ is, then you have to go to one more passage. So let's flip over to Revelation chapter 19. And, of course, if you're using an electronic, you're probably faster than I am. And listen to what it says, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so now we have a parallel. We've got a connection back to Revelation 12, 17. So let's see if there's some more indicators of what the testimony of Jesus is. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus. Aha, here comes a working definition. Is the spirit of prophecy. Wow. So the spirit of prophecy would be with God's commandment keeping people, and that's important to know. Now, we're going to study that later in this week, so you stay with us because there's a lot we're going to learn as we go through this together. But let's get back to this. So if Satan is against those who keep the commandments of God, this is the reason why he works so hard at dismantling God's commandment-keeping people. So how does he do that? Well, he introduces false doctrine. He introduces false preachers, false teachers. He introduces false worship. He introduces false diets and false ideas and false teachings and fake, fake, fake. So he does that over and again, and he does it so thoroughly and so completely, and he does it so, in such a sneaky way that there are things that have changed in the church, and we don't even know when did it happen. Just like we didn't know when women became bold in smoking until we actually go back and understand that Edward Bernays is the one who started it. And actually, you can put the finger right on Edward because he was the guy who found a way to make it attractive to women because it gave them a sense of power. And if it gave them a sense of power, and then the men were also drawn to the woman who was smoking, then women, in turn, wanted to smoke. Well, if you have the whole world basically, basically worshiping on Sunday, and that's all, that's Roman Catholicism, that's all the Baptists, that's all the Methodists, that's all the Church of God in Christ, that's all the Church of Christ, that's all the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, I mean, I've said the Methodists, uh, the Church of England, and I could go on and on and on. So all of those people, so what would happen if you just pulled all of them together? What would happen if you had united all of them? What would happen if you just said, look, we have so much in common that we really ought to be one? Well, if you structure it that way, the argument becomes strong, and then when you have this unity, between all of these groups, then you begin to realize that they really stopped doing something that Jesus said in Matthew 28. So go with me to Matthew chapter 28, and I'm going to show you what they, what they actually talk about not doing. In fact, this is actually in some of the documents that they have signed together in Matthew 28, and you're going to see this declaration that Jesus gives, and he gives it to all those who are Christians. All right? Well, let me get over there. Here it is, Matthew 28, starting with verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted, probably Thomas. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and that's anybody who becomes a Christian, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So let's look at this. First of all, salvation is both individual, but it's also global. So when we try to make Jesus the savior of just black people, or just white people, or just Hispanic people, or just Asian people, we do a disservice because that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, go ye into all nations, teach all nations. Well, that means 
you got to come out of your comfort zone. And you have, to inter you have to interface with people who are not like yourself. And then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, then you begin to look at what Jesus did. And Jesus went to the church every Sabbath day, seventh day, as he stood up for to read in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And the Bible also says, as his custom was on the Sabbath day. So you end up with this repeating or repetitive theme that Jesus outlines very clearly in his life, which is not random, but which is very intentional. So once we see that, then we understand that those who are worshiping on the seventh day are actually keeping the same day that is from creation. It's way back in Genesis 2. In fact, let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, I want you to see that this is not a Jude Jewish thing, but actually it is a God thing, and it is God giving it to Adam and Eve his creatures, his creation. So go to uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Creation was done. And all the host of them, celestial bodies. And on the, and, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Key statement. So is this about a Jewish thing? No, this is actually God saying, I came to the seventh day, I laid it down, and I rested. This is the day that I am sanctifying, setting apart. Listen to what it says in verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So, one of the reasons why we find it difficult to really accept some of these elements is because we're trying to be Christian but also believe evolution. That's a problem. And that doesn't mix. It's like the proverbial oil and water. So what we need to accept is either you're going to believe that God created the heavens and the earth or you have to believe in evolution. And then if you believe in evolution, you don't have a seven-day cycle. Even if you try to say, well, it happened over thousands of years, well, the Sabbath wouldn't be until every 7,000th year. That's ludicrous because then Jesus couldn't have gone into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Doesn't work out. So ultimately, when we go to the word of God, it makes sense. But because we approach the word of God with all of the stuff that's been poured into to our culture, into society, into the churches of today, just like we just learned, or as we just learned from the Council on Laodicea and also from Constantine's enactment, we begin to realize we're literally following, here's the big word, tradition. It's not scriptural. But let's go back to this conjoining of all of these religions. So if we connect all of these religions and we pull them all together, there is a word for it. It's called ecumenism, making one religion out of many beliefs. Well, what happens if you do that? The people who are over here that are keeping the seven-day Sabbath and are loyal to the scripture, guess what? They're easily identifiable, and they can be uh, exterminated, terminated, moved out of the way, whatever, whatever they want to do. Because this little group over here that is keeping the commandments of God is a little group. In fact, that's the reason why the Bible calls them a remnant. It calls them a remnant because it's not a bunch of us. It's just a little group. But they're a little happy group. They are a little group that is holding on to what Jesus has asked them to hold on to. And it doesn't matter that they don't have the numbers. They may not have the mega church because the, 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 mess the message, pardon me, the message that comes out of Scripture is not a message that everybody wants and everybody will adhere to. I mean, how many times have I heard in ministry that people are saying, well, I can't leave my church because my mother goes there. Well, we've always been a member of that faith. Well, you know, we have been uh, three generations ago. My great, great grandmother was a charter member of such and such a church and so on and so forth. And everybody has a relational understanding of why they do what they do instead of being on principle. That's a problem.
So the Lord is asking us to step out on the word of God, his word, and then when we step out on his word, then we are moving out on faith. And we have been given faith. The Bible says to everyone has been given a measure of faith. And so we have to trust God and his word. So when we look at the churches all packed and 60,000 people sitting in a stadium somewhere down in Texas and people who are connected with a particular ministry and they're 30,000 you know, strong and uh, in, in one in another church and there are 5,000 going to this church and 2,000 at that church and, and 25,000 at another church and we're sitting there and our mouths are drooling and saying, boy, couldn't we have a church like that? It's kind of hard to get to when you're worshiping on the day that nobody else respects. So when we look at that, we have to ask ourselves, okay, so what's really happening when all of these churches are picking the Bible and they're are choosing the Bible or engaging the Bible and they are preaching some aspects of truth and they are preaching some aspects that are literally from the word of God, but they've got the day all wrong, which is a really big deal because it starts in the beginning, in Genesis chapter two, and then it comes all the way to Revelation and we're called to come back to worship the Lord in Revelation chapter 14, six through 12, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, listen to the language, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and here's your key phrase, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. That's creation language. That's also language from the fourth commandment. So all the way back in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, you have this creation language, this fourth commandment language, being repeated by the first angel of Revelation chapter 14, 6 through 12. I want to suggest that the Sabbath and creation are pretty pivotal, pretty important, pretty significant. So now we have a question that has to be answered. I pitched it to you, what is the, what is the reason or what is the element that uh, has to be answered. So we're gonna suspend right here and pick this up on tomorrow. And when we come together on tomorrow, we're gonna deal with the word syncretism as we go from syncretism into what it looks like today. And I'll just give you this because you have it on the screen. You've looked at it. Syncretism, the amalgamation of truth and error. We want to unpack that. So how does syncretism and ecumenism come together to create a situation that's going to be volatile, literally, for the people of God. We want to thank you for being with us and taking a journey through history and also the Word of God today. And as we go further into the study of God's Word, I pray you'll invite other people to be with us tomorrow, same time, same place, right here, as we go through this virtual camp meeting, 2020 Vision, Revelation. And let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to see clearly what we've studied today. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us clarity, understanding, and a deeper appreciation for the integrity of your word. Help us, Lord, to follow your word and your word only is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.